Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I wanted to start a new series where I'm gonna analyze chess games. And to start off, I wanted to analyze the first game of this year in of myself that I played myself in the Swiss Team Championship. Let's get straight into it. Um, my opponent here opened with d4, and I'm playing with the black pieces in this position. So I responded with knight to f6, and I wanted to go into some kind of Grunfeld Indian or King's Indian defense, depending on what happened next. And my opponent going into the main line, c4, having another pawn in the center, good move in this position. And now g6. And I'm still leaving myself open if I go for d5, d5 to Grunfeld Indian or maybe just e5. Um, d5 Grunfeld Indian or d6 into a King's Indian, but the bishop is going to go here onto g7 anyway, so I didn't really care at this point, and my opponent didn't really seem too familiar with the Indian game theory at all, because he was already um, thinking on the third move, he saw for like five minutes in this position. He went into the main line with knight to c3, and now d5 indicating the Grunfeld Indian defense, striking into the center and putting a pawn into the center yourself, a good, a good move. And in this position, knight f3 was played. I go, went ahead, bishop g7, um, fianchettoing this nice bishop on this like, long diagonal. And at some point, white needs to do something about this pawn, or otherwise I'm just going to capture here. Maybe some queen's gambit variation or something. So my opponent played e3 trying to solidify this pawn, which is technically playable, but after castles, I kind of got the position that I wanted, and here he took, which is good, c takes d5, knight takes d5, and now I've got a pretty strong knight in the center that he wants to get rid of, and he does so by playing e4, which is a little bit inaccurate, and it's also, it gives black the initiative and an advantage because you're basically wasting a tempo. He played e3 two moves ago and now he plays e4, which wastes a tempo and I take here anyway um, on c3, so I would have taken anyway if you had played e4 or not. He could have developed um, the bishop in this position. Bishop here would have been a little bit better. I take here. Nothing is lost for white in this position, but I've got a comfortable position, and according to the engine, I'm better after b takes c3 and c5 striking in the center. And this is one of the main ideas of the Grunfeld Indian, and that is why I like this um, opening so much, because if you take here as white, you have this nice bishop, which forks the king and the rook and is completely winning, and you can't advance the pawn either because of the same tactic. So. Basically, the pawn is being attacked and it can't move, it can only be defended. And my opponent played bishop e3 to defend the pawn another time, and now it's solidified with four defenders. So, in the Grunfeld Indian, you always want to just pressure the center, basically, because the pawn can't move, as I already showed. And so I developed another piece, knight d6, my opponent tries to castle at some point, and you're going to see that he wasted a couple tempos, and he should have castled at some point earlier. Bishop e2 now prepares this, but I uh, develop another piece, bishop g4. And now he kind of, this is a little bit nasty, that the bishop, not this diagonal, the bishop constantly looks at this rook, and that's why the d5 pawn can't really move, and here... He played e5 to kind of shut down my bishop, which is a good move in this position. Uh, I take here on d4, c take d4, and I bring my rook into the game. And now we already see that he still hasn't castled, and he develops his queen in this position, queen d2. And now I go in with the knight. Um, knight a5, certainly a good move, supported by the rook. And I might try to attack bishop and queen in this position, and I get uh, the bishop pair, which would be okay, because I've got this nice bishop that can come to these diagonals, and it would not be opposed by another 
opposing bishop. So I bring in the knight, and now this is the first real mistake of the game, which gives me the advantage. He plays rook c1, and in this position, king safety is really important, and the engine desperately wants to castle in this position and bring the king to safety. But he develops a rook, but now I can trade rook takes c1, check queen takes c1. And now I try to pressure this pawn, centralizing the queen, also get this rook ready to come into the game. And here you already see the position is quite bad for, uh, for white already, because this rook doesn't really play a part. And the queen in this position uh, went to be one to defend the pawn. In this position, the engine, and I checked that with Stockfish, the engine wants to castle still and just allow in this position, allow this take on a tube and would play this position being down a pawn, but as a human being, I understand my opponent who um, who supported the pawn, again, defended the pawn but with the queen, but the problem is now the bishop gets activated. Um, the bishop wasn't really doing a lot on g4, so now it attacks the queen. The queen needs to still defend the pawn. Um, queen to b2, and now the, uh, the rook comes into the game. And now you see my pieces are very active, a very nice position, quite comfortable to play. My opponent castled, which is okay, but in this position it's already quite a bad position to be to be honest. Rook c2, and I marked that with a great move because it basically attacks the queen and the undefended bishop on e2. And because he castled one move earlier, the bishop is not defended anymore, and now he basically needs to guard the bishop with the queen only move is really to go to b5 um so that the queen and the bishop actually defend each other and now i can queen trade which is a good move and after bishop takes the problem is in this position i'm going to win this pawn and i'm gonna have to connect the pass pawns here on the queen side so the problem is I want to queen trade because queens are quite difficult to calculate, especially if you at some point get low on time. And I just want to want to trade off material, win this pawn, and then just be up one pawn with a very comfortable position with these uh, with these pass pawns. So I'm comfortable with queen trading, and now a nice in between move before capturing on a two. I want to kick this bishop with a6 and bishop goes to a4 not really a auto, any auto square that the bishop really has the bishop is quite restricted at this point and now i captured on a2 winning a pawn and gaining a tempo on the bishop forcing it onto the back rank which it then and now you see on in marked in blue the very nice pawns that i'm gonna pass at some point push forward because two connected passes are quite dangerous. So at this point, I centralized my knight because it wasn't doing a lot on, um, on a5 anyway, so attacking the bishop. And now my opponent spotted a very nice tactic, which is okay. He forks the knight and the rook at this point, but it allows to simplify the position. And I allowed to fork because my goal is basically to simplify and trade off material which I did by taking on, a, on e3, he took on a2, knight takes f1, king takes f1, and you could have maybe changed the move order slightly, but what happens is that I'm up a pawn and I've got a bishop pair, which is now going to get activated with bishop h6. And now a very instructive endgame arises, and in the opening and middle game, I kind of spent not that much time because I was well prepared with this line and I knew the tactics and I'm a rather good middle game player but I'm quite terrible in the end game so for e nearly each move that you're gonna see I spend at least like three to five minutes even though some of the moves are kind of normal moves like this one king f8 centralizing the king I just didn't want to really allow anything um, because I think I'm winning in this point and he offered me a draw in this point which I um, I refused because I thought I was actually winning, which I am. So he tries to 
kind of activate his knight. I bring the king closer. He plays f3. I didn't really understand the move, but he kind of tries to get counterplay, I guess. And now my pawns can be pushed forward um, with b5. And I think that this endgame is very instructional because it basically shows how to convert a slight advantage only being up one pawn, but on a high level, this should actually be enough to win, even though I'm not that high rated player, but it should be enough to win in this position, especially because it we've got two connected pass pawns. So he activates his knight, knight e4, and I trade off more material, which I wanted to do anyway, giving him a double pawn as takes e4. So what happens after I block the pawns, first of all, with e6, g3, and I activate the king. And now we have reached an opposite bishop endgame, where bishops of opposite colors are dark and a light square bishop. But I'm again up, up a pawn, and these connected pass pawns are really strong. So for me also to analyze this game, it, it was quite instructional, because I was not sure over the board what exactly to do and whether or not it's actually winning, because I always thought most of the times opposite color bishop end games tend to be quite drawish, but in this position, black can actually win the game. He centralized his king, which is a good move, of course. You need to activate your king. A5, now creating this barrier so the king can't really enter, which is important for me, because I don't want to have him getting any counterplay it would be unnecessary, I think. So he pushed d5, trying to get rid of his of his uh, double pawn. If I take the pawn takes, and he also gets a pass pawn. So I did not really want to allow this. So I activated my bishop, bishop c1. He attacked my bishop, bishop moves back. And now we see the problem in his position. Um, all of his pawns, or like three of his pawns, are all in one row. And they're all on the same uh, on the same uh, color, so the same color as my bishop. So this is why now he kind of gets a problem with defending all the pawns. He attacks my bishop, bishop g1, and now you see the problem. Not all of these pawns can actually def be defended. He first of all saved his h pawn, bishop h2, and now the question really is which pawn should he give up? And he should protect the e pawn, um, but he didn't. He probably thought that the double pawn is not that that important anyway, and he pushed g4, which is a mistake, but quite difficult to position already. He would lose another pawn anyway, so I grabbed it. Bishop takes e5. Now he gets rid of one of the pawns in the middle, d takes e6, check, f takes e6. And now he goes to the, the queen side to defend. Um, g5, quite an important move. Fixing the pawn structure, and I don't want this bishop to have any targets. And at this point, my pawns are still on white squares. So I want to put them on dark squares so that his bishop can't attack my pawns. And I also fix the pawn structure so that at some point I can create a Zugzwang situation where he can't really move. And if he wants to move, he would need to sacrifice a pawn in this position. So he plays king b3, um, h6, again, fixing the pawn structure, putting the pawn on a dark square. He just moves around with the king, king c2. I bring my king closer, king d3, bishop f4. He goes in king d4, d5, check another pawn that goes onto a dark square, forcing him back. King c5. And now I kind of infiltrate the position and I'm ready to support my pass pawns on the queen side. He takes the opposition. I support, I uh, improve my bishop, bishop c3. He moves around with his bishop h4. And now the pawns march forward. He moves back with the king, king c2, bishop f2. Now I improve my Bishop, my bishop wants to go to d4 at some point. King moves. And in this position, I play b4, uh, advancing both my passed pawns and creating this barrier so that the king can't really attack the pawns. King a goes to a2. Now I enter the position, king d4. Bishop moves back, attacks my pawn with bishop c6, but I just keep moving forward. 
a3 now ping b3 and here you need, yeah i need to calculate that my bishop can still defend the pawns bishop d5 and now you see that he controls the light square so no real progress can be made um because his bishop and the king are both on the queen on the queen side so i can't really make progress so what i did now because yeah i, I improved my my bishop first bishop c3 and now all of this defensive jato which is kind of nice so king a2 king e3 so my king is ready to win some pawns on the king side um this is a constant threat so he can't really move his king away from the queen side otherwise my pawns might come forward he goes to b3 king f4 king a2 he moves back and forth king c, um, g3 king b3 and now king takes h3 which wins the third pawn and even with a colored bishops this end game is winning for black in this position he Try to defend a little bit longer. Bishop e6, king e uh, g3, king h2. He can't really do a lot. He can only defend. He has no counterplay option. King e h4. He moves back. King b3, h4, uh, h5. G takes h5. King takes h5. He gives a check. King g4. Gives not check. King f3. And now bishop f5 g4 and in this position white has to give up the bishop otherwise the pawn is gonna just promote to a queen and then i just win this pawn and this pawn is gonna march forward so in this position he didn't really see any defense um, and he resigned the game a very instructive game in my opinion that i played perfectly not really but the engine finds some inaccuracies, but I think for my level and for the fact that I'm not a great endgame player, I still think this is quite instructive and I learned something from playing the game and analyzing the game. And I also hope you guys learned something and you're also looking forward to some more chess analysis videos. You can also in the comments mention if I should analyze a game, maybe your game or a famous game from some pro player from the present or maybe the past. Leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I would appreciate your comment and seeing you back on the videos next time. Bye.